Hello and welcome to the Cyber Den, your weekly dose of tech and games. I, Jake, will be chatting with professional actor, musician and author John Patrick Lowry. You may best know him as the voice of the sniper from everyone's favourite war-themed hat simulator, Team Fortress 2. Thanks for coming, mate. Absolutely, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, John, please tell everyone listening, what inspired you to become an actor? Because you were originally pursuing a career in music, weren't you? So what inspired the change? Well, I met my wife, Ellen McLean, on a European tour of a Broadway show, and I was playing guitar and banjo in the pit orchestra, and she was in the cast. And I found out that the actors were making more than I was, and so I convinced and cajoled and cajoled and convinced the producers to let me audition to understudy one of the roles because on, on the pretense that the role that I was understudying uh, didn't sing, he just uh, told jokes and stuff like that. And so I, I told him, you know, I could play the guitar and banjo backstage, then run on stage and, and tell the, you know, the comedic parts. And I finally convinced them. And then in uh, Palermo, Sicily, the percussionist had decided to just go home and not tell anybody. And so the conductor came to me and asked me if I'd ever played percussion. I said, sure. And so we were wandering around the basement of this 18th century opera house looking for a hi-hat and a kick drum. And when we managed to find those, getting the ride cymbal and the crash cymbal and the snare and the tom, stuff like that was pretty easy. And orchestra bells and glockenspiel and all that kind of stuff. So I was sitting there surrounded by my banjo and my guitar and all this percussion, playing all three of those. And then the guy playing another role got sick and the guy playing the role that I was understudying had been playing that role. So they decided to put him into that role and have me go on stage uh, uh, understudying. And so I, uh, I started my professional acting career telling jokes to a bunch of Sicilians who didn't speak English. So it was very glorious. Now, about your music career, what was it like back then playing music? Would you say fun stuff? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and it was uh, challenging, too, because uh, me and my partner, Ron Keith, we both played acoustic guitar in a kind of a jazz fusion world music uh, kind of style in, in, in uh, music that we were both composing. I was writing most of it, but he computed, contributed quite a bit, too. And so this was not your bar band kind of stuff. It was uh, instrumental music and it was fairly complex. And, uh, you know, we got to do some fun stuff. We got to open for Buddy Rich and for Thad Jones and Mel Lewis and a bunch of nice people. Um, but it was always a challenge. And you had to, like, schmooze till you bruise 28 hours a day, 18 days a week, uh, just to keep the work coming. And when I got this gig playing this Broadway show, all of a sudden I was just working three hours a night and I didn't have to schmooze with anybody and getting a steady paycheck. And... Uh, and then I met Ellen and we got into this stuff and uh, uh, I just kind of fell into acting with her, um, started doing more and more gigs uh, originally in shows that she was hired to do and I, they just hired me too, kind of. And uh, then we both decided to move out to Seattle because we knew if we stayed in New York, we'd never see each other again because actors are always working out of town. And we had heard that there was a great professional theater scene out here and there is. And we moved out in 1989 and have been uh, working ever since. So, so that's kind of how that worked. So what would you say were some of your inspirations or favorite musicians out there? Oh, uh, well, I mean, I'm very much into Balinese and Indian classical music. That certainly uh, uh, influenced the kind of thing that I was doing. But I was also very much influenced by people like Keith Jarrett and um, Pat Metheny uh, a guy named Leo Kotke, uh, John Fahey. So there was a, a, a folk element in our, in, a kind of a folk bluegrass element in our music too. Um, that was the kind of thing. And actually, if people want to go to my YouTube channel, they can hear some of the stuff that we recorded back then. Shameless plug right there. That's okay with me, of course. There you go. <laughs> it's not, of course, it's not really a plug if you're not making any money off of it. It's just up there for people to listen to if they want to. That is, that is. Then again, I'm shameless plugging everywhere all the time in, in regular conversation, and that's uh, that's why I don't have friends. But um, but anyway, enough about me. That's showbiz. You've taken part in many projects, but most famously as the Sniper, the rugged Aussie from Team Fortress 2. That's right, so, mate. How did you get the role? And of course, do you enjoy playing the character? And if so, what is it you like about him? Well, I got the role, uh, like I get every role, I auditioned. Um... Uh, to anyone who is interested in getting into uh, voice acting, 
you need to get a voice demo and get an agent and uh, then uh, start uh, doing auditions. Um, Valve started auditioning back around 2000 and I first worked with them in Half-Life 2 as the Citizens and Odessa Cubbage and uh, they hired my wife to be the Overwatch in that game and then they hired me to play uh, the Sniper and I just have a whole bag of fun playing the Sniper because I mean he's about 10% Australian accent and the rest me except that I don't kill people. Um, but I love I love the fact that, that he thinks of himself as a professional, and uh, I mean they're, the the writers at Valve are are so interested in creating characters that have real texture that the players can actually like or dislike and really get to know. And uh, when they put together the meet the sniper and meet the scout and meet the spy and all those kind of things, it was just a great 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 fun. Uh, the writers Jay Pinkerton and Eric Wolpaw are incredible guys, very, very creative. And uh, I also worked with Chet Falasek on Half-Life 2. I mean, all the guys at Valve are just very, very creative folks. So all the Valve software crew, you'd definitely say good bunch to work with as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, going out, Valve is based here in uh, in Bellevue, which is right across the lake from Seattle. So we just drive over there to do the recordings, and uh, we always have a great time. I mean, you know, voice work in video games is basically fun for pay. Uh, you know, it's basically getting to play Army when you were a little kid, except people are paying you to do it, so. Were there any standout lines or bits of dialogue that you especially enjoyed as the sniper? Well, my favorite of all time is in Meet the Sniper when I'm talking to my dad on the phone. I'm saying, you know, Dad, Dad, I'm... I'm, I'm not a crazed gunman, Dad. I'm an assassin. Well, the difference being one is a job and the other's mental sickness. That kind of defines the sniper for me. What do you think about the game's popularity and the many fan-made comics, cartoons, and animation that feature the Team Fortress 2 crew, including, of course, the sniper? Right, well, I mean, once again, it goes back to the writing. I think, you know, you can put together a game where, you know, you're trying to win and you're be trying to beat the other team, uh, and the game will function as a game just fine. But if you put together characters, and if you think in those terms, the writers are thinking, you know, how is this character memorably different from another character? And you get a crew, uh, and each character has their own personality, their own definite personality, and their own voice, and their own style. Then uh, people are going to very much identify with those characters. We've been all over the world. Uh, we've been to Dubai, Sweden, England, uh, and all over the United States and met people cosplaying, uh, you know, characters from Team Fortress 2, because I think the characters are very memorable. And I like to think that, you know, the, the voice acting is a part of that. You know, you start with good writing, and then it's the voice actor's responsibility to take that writing and make it come to life and turn it into a human being. And I think, really, one of the central things that makes the characters in Team Fortress 2 so memorable, and what makes a lot of the characters at Valve so memorable, is their is their use of comedy. They are not afraid to make their characters really hilarious. I mean, when you think that at one point the sniper gets the head of an owl and says things like, hoot, I'm an owl, and stuff like that. You know, that's just silly and stupid. And uh, I think that a lot of uh, game players play games because they want to be silly and stupid. Were there any particular videos out there that the fans have created, for example, you know, some of the animations or parodies or even song remixes, any that perhaps you managed to check out or caught your eye? Well, uh, every once in a while somebody will contact me on Facebook, and anybody out there, my Facebook page is John Patrick Lowry. If you want to be friends, just friend me and I'll friend you. Um, and, you know, if, if uh, I just got a, a, a YouTube video link from a fan uh, just a couple days ago, <laughs> And it, but there have been so many at this point. I mean, I've seen a lot of them, and uh, they're wonderfully creative. You know the the use of animation and the use. You know it's great that uh, Valve open sourced their you know their their game structure so that that you know fans can get in and kind of create their own stuff. And uh, even the stuff that that they've generated from from their own imaginations is hilarious to me, and I, I love it all. Now, aside from the sniper, were there any other standout voice acting roles that you were fond of, be they in video games, radio, or the like? Well, uh, for many, many years, I played Sherlock Holmes on the Further Adventures of Sherlock Holmes through a, a company called Imagination Theater. Uh, they just closed a couple months ago, but uh, from 2001, I think, until 2016, or early 2017, I played Sherlock Holmes, and that was a great 
you know, just a dream come true. Um, but certainly in uh, video games, uh, the, the sniper is certainly a standout. I certainly enjoyed playing Odessa Cubbage in Half-Life 2. Um, I had a great little cameo in uh, Halo ODST where I played this horrifically awful South African rapist guy. And that was, that was a lot of fun because he got, ended up getting torn, literally torn limb from limb by a, by a mob, an angry mob. Um, Warden Harms in uh, Fear Project Origin was very challenging, and oh, I forget the name of the guy in Infamous, uh, but uh, uh, th those were those were a lot of fun, and uh, oh, and well, and and uh, another shameless plug: Ellen and I are both in a new game uh, scheduled to be released later this year called The Church in the Darkness where we play a married couple that are cult leaders and the the player's job is to go down to the cult and try to rescue their nephew from from these guys and uh, that's been a very interesting project now you mentioned about half-life 2 there i can imagine have a lot of half-life fans been pestering you about the existence of half-life 2 episode 3 well, uh, what I like to tell them is that poor Gabe Newell got assaulted by the number three when he was very young, and he's never been able to to countenance its presence in his presence since then. So, yeah, a lot of fans ask about that, and I am as just as anxious as any of them because I have played all the episodes myself, and, you know, I'd like to work. Um, but at this point, they have not uh, talked to me about it. Um, so, uh, but, but, but I'm a voice actor. I mean, they could be doing all kinds of things and not talk to me about it. They'll just call me in when they need me. That sad, sad story about Gabe Newell. I will never look at the number three ever again, the same way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, we need to, to give him the, uh, the appreciation and the sympathy that he deserves, uh, over this uh, traumatic event in his past. Gabe, if you're listening, I'm going to send you a get well soon card and a batch of flowers with <laughs> Two, two, two and one flowers. Yeah, I'm not going to send you three bouquets of flowers because reasons. Exactly. Right, right. Keep it binary. <laughs> All right, then. So beyond voice acting, you've even done your fair share of work in front of the camera and, of course, on the stage. So please tell us more about that. It couldn't have been easy stuff, could it? Well, uh, I mean, acting is a very involving job. Uh, even though it's not my first love, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I've gotten to work with Sir Alan Akeborn uh, and uh, with uh, Brian Yorkey and some other wonderful directors. And uh, working on a play by Akeborn, directed by him, was uh, one of the high spots of, of my acting career. Uh, it's always very challenging because... Uh, uh, well, of course, on camera work, you actually have to show up early and get dressed and get into makeup and wait around for lights and sound and all that kind of stuff and other actors to be there. With voice acting, you can show up in your pajamas anytime you want to, basically. But uh, on the stage, of course, you have to you have to create an entire character in one chunk. You're doing something for two or three hours. And so that has its own special sets of, of challenges. But it's it's great work, and I enjoy it a lot. Um, I've, I can't even count the number of, uh, stage shows I've been in. I've gotten to, to act all over the United States on stage and, uh, and once in Palermo, Sicily. So, so, uh, I think that if you're going to have a career in performing, you need to be able to, you need to be open to any medium that there is out there because, of course, the, the challenge as an actor is just to keep the rent paid and keep a roof over your head. And uh, Ellen and I have been very fortunate in being able to, to feed ourselves and keep our bills paid uh, through performing. It's been great. To top, to top it all off, six years ago, your book, Dancing with Eternity, was released, to which you won the Forward Magazine's Forward Firsts Award for Best Debut Novel. Could you tell us a bit more about said book, alongside with uh, your inspirations to write, and, of course, some details on the development process? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. Uh, Dancing with Eternity uh, was kind of inspired by a very tragic moment in my life, um, and I can't give that away without kind of putting spoilers out there. Uh, so it's a very personal book on one end, but it's also a science fiction adventure novel. Um, and my, my brain tends to work in the structure of a joke. Uh, and I, one thing that struck me as hilarious is how, how weird 
uh, quantum physics is. I, I love quantum physics. I love lots of, of, of science. But, but the, the thought that quantum physics tells us that the only reason that we don't fly up through the ceiling and out into outer space right now is that we probably won't. And that struck me as so hilarious. And I started thinking, you know, what would quantum physics have looked like to, say, Archimedes? And I thought, can I develop a science that doesn't violate the science that we know now that would look as weird to us as quantum physics would have looked to Archimedes? And so I set the book 2,000 Years in the Future and uh, developed a, an entire science uh, that allows human beings to keep themselves going forever. Uh, every 60 to 80 years, they have to reboot. They have to go into the hospital for three months and completely clean out all the waste products in every cell and redo everything. And also they have to reboot their memories so that they have room to remember their next life. And, and I just wanted to do a little scientific experiment where you change one thing. You look at humanity and you take away death and look at what human beings would behave like if they didn't die anymore. And I, uh, you know, one of the first things was, well, okay, what do you do with all the people? And so I posited that we would figure out a way to travel from star to star in a reasonable amount of time and colonize planets around other stars. So you have an infinite universe to expand into, so you're not worrying about that anymore. Um, but also, would people reproduce anymore if they were living forever? Um, would they just get interested in other things? And particularly, and, and uh, the way my mind works, I had to make the rebooting process really, 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 really expensive because I wanted to comment on the costs of healthcare and all that kind of stuff. And I love putting my characters in situations where they're constantly making choices between something bad and something slightly less bad or something good and something slightly less good so that there's lots of moral ambiguity in the in the uh, in the book and i like to ask myself you know how much would we put up with in order to get our our heart's desire and if we got our heart's desire what would we do with our time so you have this galaxy full of human beings that are running around every place and every time they get into trouble, if they get into a car wreck or if they fall off a mountain, they simply upload their personality onto this telepathic internet and wait for their bodies to be fixed and they keep living. And if they just get old and sick, then they just go into the hospital and get well. So what happens if somebody shoots you? Well, you go to the hospital and get well and they have to pay for it. So murder isn't a thing anymore. What do you do about warfare? If you're not dying and seeing God anymore or going to heaven, what do you do about religion? How does how is politics affected? So it's uh, it's it, at one in one sense it's a travel log. You go around uh, several places in the galaxy to look at different human societies and different ways that human beings have responded to this technology. But at the core is a very personal story, uh, a family-based story. Uh, that I think is very moving. I mean, I've had a, a lot of feedback from, from people who've read the book that said they cried at the end and stuff that you don't usually get from a science fiction novel, I think. Now, let's see, what else? Uh, the, the process. The process was, since I came out of being a jazz musician, I mean, authors have different ways of working. Some people do a very serious and detailed outline and they block out each chapter and make sure they know what's happening as they go along the way. Uh, as a jazz musician, I'm very much into improvisation, and so I got I knew the general plot outline, and I knew the places, the various points along the way that I wanted to hit, um, and the kinds of things I wanted to talk about. But other than that, I really improv the whole thing. I would the my favorite moment in writing is when I surprise myself, when the characters surprise me, when I've set up something and it creates a situation that I wasn't expecting. And so that happens quite a few times in the book. Uh, that's kind of that's my style, and I've I've brought it to uh, I've done some script doctoring and uh, some writing for theater, and that I just think is if the author can surprise himself, then he's certainly going to surprise the reader, and that's what I aim to do. Would you say there are any plans for a sequel or or even future bits of writing, well, radio plays, etc.? Yeah, I mean, I have four projects, four writing projects going on right now. Um, two of them are novels. One of them is is a, a 
a sequel kind of uh, I mean the, the story is very much self-contained so so uh, I've been thinking a lot about is there is there another story or are there more stories to be told in this universe that I've created because I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who say they would love to write to read any any book that is set in this universe with this technology and so so that's one project I have another project that is more autobiographical but is fiction and then I'm working on a screenplay for a television series that no one's no one's given me any money for this is t totally on spec and uh, oh what is the fourth one? Oh no no the fourth one I completed so I only have three projects now and just remember, in case you need any inspiration for new characters in these projects, you can always turn to one particular gentleman. What was his name? Uh, J Jake the something? S something the oh, voice? Jake, Jake. Uh, le, le voix? Jake il voce? I forget, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jacques il voce. Yeah, that's, that's what was his name. That's my evil French rival. <laughs> Yeah, I will keep you in mind. And speaking of voicing uh, for novels, uh, anyone out there who likes uh, my wife Ellen McLean and I to talk to them for 16 hours, Imagination Theater did produce my novel as an audiobook complete with music and sound effects and Ellen and I reading all the characters. So that is available on iTunes and Audible and Amazon and you can get that anywhere. Another shameless plug. I'm teaching you well, you know. I'm teaching you well. Yeah. If you think you're teaching me how to be shameless, I think I'm older than you are. So I may be teaching you, young Skywalker. All right, got me there, got me there. <laughs> now, before we round off this interview, is there anything you'd like to say to all your fans and admirers out there? Well, Ellen and I both love you guys. We've, we've gotten to meet lots of you all around the country and all around the world. And... Um, Cyberbullying is an issue that is very important to us, and we like doing anything we can to fight it. Um, uh, I want you guys all to stay safe and have a lot of fun, because that's what games should be about. Don't hurt each other. Don't insult each other. Let the sniper insult you. We're professionals. We'll do it right. How's that? Inspirational. <laughs> John, thank you so much for coming to this interview. Thank you for having me, Jake, and uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, uh, I just can't tell you how much I enjoy talking to you, and, and uh, this was great. And I'd also like to thank my lovely listeners out there for tuning into this great interview on the Cyber Den, your weekly dose of tech and games. Thanks for coming, John, and let me just say before we go, God save the Queen! <laughs> ah, you blighter, you wanker! You know, I'm down here in the other hemisphere, the right hemisphere, where the sun goes across the northern part of the sky and the water knows how to go down the drain. I'd also like to apologise to all Team Fortress fans out there for that awful impression that I just did of the sniper. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, don't judge me. <laughs> Honest to God, I am a good voice actor, please, please believe me. Well, you know, it's, it's hard to do the sniper when you're talking to the sniper. I would be very, uh, very reticent to do, say, Ronald Reagan if I was talking to Ronald Reagan. You know what I mean? Would look a bit spooky. Yeah, yeah. Creepy. 